Uh, I'm Whitney Smith, and I am the producer of this month's VAMP. And first off, I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for being here and supporting So Say We All and all of our storytellers and our arts community here in San Diego. So, yes, give yourself a round of applause. So before we get started, just a little bit of housekeeping. If you didn't notice, we're at a bar. So if you drink up your glass and you're done, pass it back so it can get washed before intermission when you go back for your next round, right? And in case you've never been to a vamp before, you have full permission to shush your neighbor. Shh. We're here to hear these stories that people have worked so hard on. So silence your phones and let them bask in your undivided attention. So who here is their first vamp? We got Vamp Virgins? Yeah! I love it. So just like you guys, I once attended my first Vamp. It was probably about eight years ago. And I was here at Whistle Stop, and it was a transformative experience. We were in this crowded bar, and it was dead silent, except for the seven strangers that got up here and told their stories. And in the crowd, we gasped together, we sighed together, we got grossed out together, and we laughed together. It was like everybody was feeling the same vibe. And that is why we're here, because stories make you feel less alone. They make you feel less crazy. They make you feel heard, that you are important, and that you matter. And that's why we're all here tonight, to hear and tell these stories. So I'm so stoked to have you guys here. All right, so I want you guys, but first to give it up for all of our September performers. We've got Tiffany Cooper, Carly Lewis, Nick Stanek, Lucky Pence, Robert Lane, and Danielle Baldino, and our first reader, Bianca Sanchez. <laughs> the last day of high school was one of the best days of my life. I walked off campus toward my dad's car, relieved that school was finally over. On the ride home, I thought my dad would share my excitement. But instead, he had some bad news. My dad had been laid off from his job. All my excitement for the future quickly dissipated. Losing your job is already a difficult experience. But there was even more pressure on my dad because he was the sole provider of our family of six. What started off as one of the best days of my life ended sadly, as my family feared for what was to come. That summer, I spent my days watching my dad go through a cycle of optimism and defeat. The rejection emails stacked up as high as our unpaid bills. My dad had worked for the Union Tribune for 21 years. With his experience, he thought he would find a job quickly. But unfortunately, there just weren't that many jobs for journalists anymore. At the end of August, I started going to school at Mesa College. One day, as my dad was driving me to class, he asked me for a favor. Bianca, I think it's time for you to get a job. Like, right now? Can I wait until winter break? No, it has to be as soon as possible. I know I've always told you that I want you to focus on school before anything else, but money is tight right now and I could really use your help. I've always looked up to my dad. He's supportive, a hard worker, optimistic, and overall, a good person. My dad is an immigrant, and he was taught to always be self-reliant. So I knew it was serious that he was asking me, his first daughter, for financial help. I didn't want to disappoint him, so I told him that I would start looking for a job that weekend. To some, Getting your first job isn't that big of a deal. But to me, someone who had horrible anxiety at the time, it was huge, and I was terrified. All I could think about was everything that could go wrong. What if my coworkers don't like me? What if my manager's a jerk? What if the customers treat me like crap? Everyone I knew that had a job hated it. But they work because that's how we survive. And I knew for my family to survive this troubling time, I had to help. Plus, I was tired of always being afraid. 
All throughout high school, I was extremely insecure and had social anxiety. I counted down the days until graduation because I hoped that after that last bell rang, I could finally say goodbye to this version of myself that I hated and become what I always wanted to be, confident. Maybe getting a job was my first chance to prove that I wasn't that same scared little girl. So that day I decided I was going to get a job. That weekend, I went job hunting at Fashion Valley Mall with my friend Raquel. We tried our best to look like adults by wearing button-up tops and oversized slacks. In my mind, we looked professional, but in reality, I looked as grown up as two kids stacked on top of each other in a trench coat. <laughs> Worst of all, neither of us had any job experience. So when we handed over our resumes, it was just a piece of paper with our name and phone numbers on it. Most employers didn't even glance at our resumes, and the ones that did threw it in the trash. Eventually, Raquel and I gave up on the job search. It was depressing, so we decided to eat. At the food court, we passed by Wetzel's Pretzels. And on the window, I saw a sign that said, now hiring, interviews every day after 3 p.m. I pointed out the sign to Raquel. What a joke, she laughed. I mean, who wants to work at Wetzel's Pretzels? She said, as if you in the name itself was full of carbs and saturated fats. <laughs> You're right, I laughed with her. I mean, only a desperate loser would stoop that low. So the next day I applied to Wetzel's Pretzels. <laughs> the manager asked for an on-the-spot interview, and the interview questions were typical. One, are you a criminal? Two, can you count money? And three, can you work weekdays, weekends, and holidays for only $8 an hour? Then the questions became more of a warning. The manager said that people had burned their faces while cooking the pretzels. She also informed me about the high turnover and how they were usually short-staffed. So I would have to do the work of two or three people most days. Despite all these warnings, I still need a job. So the manager hired me on the spot and told me I would start the next day. The following day, I was extremely nervous. When I stepped into the shop, I probably looked like a kid who got lost in the mall. I was greeted by the assistant manager, this 40-year-old, hairy, heavyset man named Ricardo. Ricardo handed me a blue visor that was being held together by staples and a puke green t-shirt with the Wetzel's Pretzels logo. The uniform smelled like a mixture of grease, sweat, and cheese. After I put on the uniform, Ricardo said I had 10 minutes to study the cash register. I told him that I had never worked a register before and I needed more time. He said, I'll just have to figure it out as I go. As the customers piled up, I started to panic. I had zero training and already had a line at the door. Unfortunately, when I panic, I don't tend to think, and it quickly becomes obvious. For instance, when the customers would hand me cash and as I was counting the bills, I would lose track and have to keep starting over. Then there was one incident where I dropped the customer's change into the tip jar. And then there was another moment where I accidentally charged the customer $200 instead of 20. After failing as a cashier, Ricardo demoted me and made me cut up pretzels to give out us samples. Fun fact about Wetzel's pretzels is that they usually take the oldest pretzels out of the display and then cut it up for samples, which means the dough is very hard on the bottom. I cut the dough into medium triangles and stuck toothpicks into each one, leaving the plate for the sample girl to, uh, to pick up. A couple of minutes after she picked up the plate, she came back into the shop yelling, who's the dummy who cut up my pretzel? Ricardo automatically pointed to me. The sample girl picked up a toothpick to show the pretzel samples were all connected at the bottom. When Ricardo realized I couldn't even cut up a pretzel, he demoted me again, <laughs> this time to Sample Girl. 
For two hours, I stood outside the shop, basically mumbling, pretzels, pretzels. Some people giggled, others looked annoyed, while most people walked past me several times so they can get multiple samples. <laughs> At the start of my third hour, a woman came up to me to ask me a question. So the sign says if you buy two pretzels, it costs $5. Does that mean it's $2.50 for just one? I never got a chance to study the menu, but I didn't want to admit to this woman that I didn't know anything. So I took a guess and said that was the correct price. The woman thanked me and said I was very helpful before she went inside. At that moment, I finally felt comfortable. Sure, I stuck to cashiering and cutting up pretzels, but I was still persistent. Maybe working wasn't gonna be as bad as I imagined it would be. But then, my inner dialogue was interrupted by screaming coming from inside the shop. It's the woman who I just spoken to. She's yelling at Ricardo, <laughs> saying that someone had incorrectly told her that our pretzels cost $2.50, and now she's demanding that they honor that price. Who told you this? Ricardo asked the woman. Although my back was facing the shop, I knew who she was pointing at. I could hear Ricardo clack his feet against the tile as he marched up behind me. With each footstep, I felt smaller and smaller as I knew I was about to get yelled at. Did you tell that woman our pretzels cost $2.50? I nodded. It's $3 for one. That's why two for five is considered a deal. I'm sorry, I never got a chance to study the menu. I mean, it's just a pretzel. It's not that big of a deal. Not a big deal? This is Wetzel's pretzels. <laughs> it is a big deal. And now because of you, her whole day is ruined. <sighs> Listen, I can't trust you being out here nor on the register. So for the rest of your shift, just restock the napkins and try not to screw that up. After my shift, I asked Ricardo when I would work next. He told me he hadn't decided, but he would call me. I knew what that meant. He wouldn't. After all, I was useless. My dad picked me up from work and I unloaded my entire day to him. My first job experience was as bad as I had feared it would be. I couldn't do a job that most people thought was beneath them. So what did that say about me? I started to believe that maybe that person I was in high school was who I really am and would always be. A scared, dumb little girl who couldn't do anything right. I was ashamed when I told my dad that I couldn't go back there. I was such a disappointment. My dad had done so much for me in my life and only asked me for this one favor. I expected for him to reprimand me for giving up so easily. But instead, he understood. He said, I wasn't a failure for quitting this job, but he also didn't want this moment to define me. It was okay if I left Wetzel's pretzels, but I still had to go back out there and get another job. And so, I did. A couple weeks after this experience, I found a position as a cashier at Marshall's. Although Marshall's was anything but glamorous, they at least spent more than 10 minutes training me. And they also helped me work on my cashiering and people skills. I worked in customer service all throughout college, and after graduating, I got a job in publishing. And about a year after my dad lost his job, he found a position as a medical writer for Scripps Health a position he still has today. My dad losing his job was an awful experience, but it also changed my character. I sometimes think about what my dad meant by letting this moment define me. I think what he meant was that the fears you've had and the mistakes you've made at one point in your life don't have to define your future. Just because I did terribly at Wetzel's Pretzels doesn't mean I have to lock myself away and never work again. Of course, I had the choice of remaining scared and defeated, but 
I choose to not feel sorry for myself, and I step out of my comfort zone. Through this choice, I'm becoming a more confident person, the person my teenage self always wanted to be. Thank you. That's Bianca Sanchez. Growing up in an unpredictable, toxic family system is a war zone of chaos and confusion. One minute, I had sober supermom. The next, she'd morph into an intoxicated, violent tyrant or vanish without warning. I desperately wanted my mother's affection, but at the same time, feared her almighty wrath and the heartache I'd suffer from her inconsistent bouts of abandonment. In the early days, she gave my brother and me everything we ever wanted. We took equestrian classes, studied martial arts, played soccer, had private music lessons. I did all the dance. For over a decade, we were the center of her world. That is until kisses turned into slaps, bedtime stories turned into screaming matches, and a haven for our family turned into a minefield that ripped us apart. I felt for her, though. My mom grew up a shy, scared little girl, often having to escape her alcoholic father's heavy hand. She desperately tried to give her children a better life, but when her dad had a stroke that paralyzed half his body, it triggered something wicked within. She began to drink uncontrollably at the age of 40. We became enmeshed, thanks in part to her dependence on Chardonnay to get through the day, and my obsession with weaning her off of it. Magical thinking had me completely convinced that if I could just make her stop drinking, everything would be okay. I'd be okay. I based my entire existence around trying to cure her of addiction, but for some people, rock bottom is death. During the summer of 2011, my brother and I put our lives on pause and headed up to Oregon to say goodbye to mom one last time. We spent our days in prison by an isolated ICU waiting room, watching helplessly as she lay sedated on mechanical ventilation. When the hospital staff removed the long white breathing tube, she launched forward with an internal electrical jolt. I grabbed her hand and held, it, held her forearm to my chest, trying to soothe her. You're doing great, Mom. It's okay, Mom. It's okay. When she took her last agonal breath, I knew all the essence in her was gone. I was supposed to be a martyr for my mother so when I failed to save the one person who mattered the most, I lost all sense of myself. She died on a Sunday morning, the day before her 57th birthday. I was 26, and my life as I knew it was over. In the muddled days after her celebration of life charade, my river of tears fell from raging rapids and I slipped down into the eerie silence of drowning. As a detour on our way home to San Diego, my brother, his wife, and I drove to his in-law's house in Sacramento to rest and recoup. His mother-in-law, Mary, softly tried to absorb and absolve us of our loss, but of course, to no avail. I no longer believed in magic. For days indistinguishable from each other, I floated around the house at unholy hours of the night, subsisting on cold leftovers because I was never hungry at the right time. My gut couldn't cooperate no matter how hard I stared at the plate of homemade pasta primavera or bowl of comfort veggie chili made specially for me. 
One day, my freshly minted surrogate mom gently sat down next to me on the living room sofa. She placed my forgotten phone on the adjacent coffee table and ever so tenderly convinced me to go see your friends, honey. It might make you feel better. It took a number of failed drafts, but I finally sent a text message to my good friend, Samantha. A few hours later, we were posted up at Bernardo's ready to tap into the nostalgia of the good old days. Samantha and I were former dorm room buddies, and she, lived, she still lived in the neighboring college town that forged our friendship. We were both highly competitive high schoolers with big plans for prestigious careers in the medical field. After four years of battling it out in academia, we got our asses handed to us more than a few times. Though it had been four years since we finished college, drinking offensive alcoholic concoctions to the point of not feeling feelings was still second nature. So off we went to see the wonderful wizard of inebriation. Our drink of choice was the Wiki Wacky Woo, a local specialty containing six different types of liquor plus a shot of Bacardi 151 in the straw. <laughs> that first sip is designed to be the only one you'll do if you do it right, sucking all the way down until there's nothing left but pink-tinged ice and prefrontal cortex impairment. <laughs> we chatted up the bartenders and other bar patrons as they cycled through. It was almost normal. When the buzz started to fade, I could feel distress edging its way back in again. I needed the next level of coping. Fucking. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it couldn't just be any random this time. I needed someone who knew me in my before times, when I was still the version of myself that I was comfortable with. There was one person I knew who would understand, and that was Andy. We originally bonded during the tail end of college while his dad was dying as a consequence of decades of alcohol abuse. We never went further than being each other's mutually not exclusive, irregular late night hookup buddies, but the situationship worked while it worked. There's nothing quite like your wounded inner child meeting another's and comparing scars. Our commiserating took some of my pain away and in return, I took his virginity. <laughs> Andy and I hadn't spoken in the four years since, but I still had his number. And no shame in me after midnight with a little liquor in me. When Samantha and I arrived at the front steps of the two-story craftsman-style house, Andy welcomed us with open arms and an open bar. So, what brings you to my neck of the woods? Andy playfully inquired. My mom died last week. Looking away and shaking his head, he said, I'm sorry, Tiff. Thanks, I whispered. Looking down at me, he asked, you want to go upstairs and talk? Sure, I shrugged. He took my hand, and together we climbed the narrow wooden staircase. I felt like my own kind of addict about to get a hit. Facing each other, we sank down onto his bed and talked about everything except the obvious. Then I turned away to let him be the big spoon. I pulled his arm around me and scooted my butt up against his crotch and his legs came to cradle mine. Before I lost my mom to addiction, we would cuddle nearly every night. She'd spoon me until my dad came upstairs and then it was time to go to my own bed. Cuddling with Andy now in his bed, I was safe. The loud outbursts of laughter began to die down as his roommates and their lovers headed off to their own bedrooms. I felt his heart on through his jeans swelling, nuzzling itself between my butt cheeks. Sorry, he said as he attempted to tuck his erection back between his thighs. It's okay, I reassured him as I turned over to kiss his mouth. He swallowed me up with his thick lips and tried to persuade my tongue to come out to play with his. After a while, I asked him, so how did you get through it? Like, how long did it take not to hurt anymore? Not gonna lie, it still hurts sometimes, he said, still cupping my head. 
it hurts less now than it used to, but it's probably always going to hurt. You just learn how to live with it. I don't want to. I whined and buried my face in his chest. I know. He squeezed me tight. You have to figure out a new reason for wanting to, though. Promise yourself to make it through the night, just at least to see the sunrise. Why? I asked. Because emotions are like waves. You just have to ride them out. If you can make it through one night, you can make it through the next, OK? I shook my head in defiance, and we started kissing again. After several hours of wakeful quasi-sleep cuddling, the sunlight began to pour in through the horizontal blinds of his bedroom window, spilling across our tangled, still fully clothed bodies. We did our goodbyes, and then he jokingly said, well, I'll see you in another four years. I kissed him one last time and carefully crept down the stairs to go find my friend. When I arrived home, I tried to quietly sneak in through the side door so no one would catch me still wearing the same clothes from the night before. My surrogate mom was already up and making pancakes and scrambled eggs for everybody. Hey, honey, how was your night? When my eyes met hers, I could see her sincerity shining through to reach me. Her warmth melted my heart. I tried to speak, but words failed me as I started to cry. She held out her arms and rushed over to me as I collapsed into the most comforting mom hug I'd had in years. That was Tiffany Cooper. I was born and raised in Southern Mississippi. In the Deep South, the details of the backstory often take longer than the actual story. <laughs> Southerners tend to drag stories out. We let things simmer, marinate like a tough piece of meat. Tonight's story is all backstory. It's about the strongest and most vulnerable relationship I have, the one with my twin sister. People ask me if I like being a twin. I always reply, being Chelsea's twin sister is like a gift. Chelsea gets the same question because, you know, twins. My twin sister tells people, I have never felt alone because I have Carly. My whole life, I have gotten mixed up with my twin sister. And I want to tell you about sometimes we've gotten mixed up, but more importantly, about how we've gotten sorted out. In 1990, my parents were both school teachers on a very modest income in Mississippi. When my mother discovered she was having twins, she insisted that my father become a high school principal. We need more money coming in, Charlie, if we're going to pay for three girls, colleges, sororities, weddings. Haley, our older sister, looks like my beautiful mama, but carries the calm disposition of my daddy. Chelsea and I look like my daddy's people, but share my mama's wide open personality. We lead with our hearts, and before our heads catch up, our mouths have usually gotten us into trouble. I call my twin sister Sissy because when we were little, Chelsea was always in trouble. I would plead with my mama, don't spank Sissy. Sissy be good, mama, I promise. Looking back, we were both bad as hell. Imagine thing one and thing two from Dr. Seuss taking over any room we went into. Fast forward two years. At the time, we lived in my mama's childhood hometown, Crystal Springs, Mississippi. I describe the town as Mayberry for Mandy Griffith, a quintessential southern town with its deep secrets and quirky charm. 
One night, my parents finally decided to hire babysitters and treat themselves to a date night. The babysitters come, two sisters from my daddy's high school. My mama wanted a one-to-one sister-to-twin ratio. <laughs> my mother, as a public school teacher, is good at giving very clear instructions. Carly likes the sippy cup with the blue stars, and Chelsea likes the sippy cup with rainbows. Carly likes to be read goodnight moon and has to sleep with her jingle bear. Chelsea likes to be sung this little light of mine and sleeps in the crib by the door. The evening was going splendidly. Mama, on her second glass of wine at dinner, enjoying the night of reprieve and visiting with the couples sitting close by. Suddenly, the waiter comes to the table and tells her someone is on the phone. Swiftly, my mama rushes to the phone at the restaurant. Are my children safe? Has my mother fallen? Was there a fire? On the other line was a very, very panicked babysitter. Miss Lewis, Miss Lewis, the twins are naked in the bathtub and we have mixed them up. <laughs> we do not know who is who. Oh, my mother takes a deep breath and in a calm voice she says, Chelsea has the mole on her left pinky finger. She still has that mole. Easy enough for my mother to straighten out and for future babysitters, she always painted my big toenail pink to avoid this unnecessary <laughs> trauma. Once Chelsea and I could talk, we helped with this confusion, unless it worked to our advantage. <laughs> Fast forward 12 years, Chelsea and I both made the high school tennis team. Now, the coach decided we should play girls doubles. A set of tall, blonde twins playing tennis doubles sounds like a cheesy Disney movie. Except, there was one problem. Chelsea was far better than me and far more competitive. There was little joy on the tennis court for the Lewis family with all the fighting and comparing of talent. My daddy, fed up with the embarrassment of watching his twin daughters fight in public, decided to pay for me to have private tennis lessons. Within six lessons, I was equal to Chelsea. The first game Chelsea and I played with no arguing, Daddy declared, problem solved, no more private lessons. He knew that this wasn't a Venus and Serena situation. The biggest improvement coming out of my lessons was my serve. Chelsea's backhand was still far superior to mine. Not in every game, and certainly not every set, but enough to keep a respectable record, we used folks' tendencies to mix us up to our advantage. I would consistently serve, and we didn't switch sides, and no one was the wiser. <laughs> Chelsea and I both chose to become educators, <laughs> like our parents. But our careers split us up for the first time. I found that I loved the schools, and the mountains, and the sea, and the people of California. Thank you. Where my mother's sister had settled in the 1970s. Chelsea earned a scholarship that would help her pay for graduate school in return for committing to teach in impoverished Mississippi schools, which Sissy was destined to do anyway. Six years passed. Chelsea was a Teach for America teacher in Cleveland, Mississippi, in the Mississippi Delta. Now, the Delta 
flat, fertile farmland. It's home of the blues, golf ball-sized mosquitoes, and, the, and generational segregation and poverty. Chelsea was living in a disheveled shotgun house and was becoming undone, rightfully so. She was mixed up in a web of emotions, insecurity, self-doubt, loneliness. I would hear... I can't do this. Carly, it's too hard. The problems are too grave. I was in graduate school at the time and drove to her the first weekend I could get away. I arrived with my basket of cleaning supplies, and that was the weekend's agenda. A clean house makes everything better. I handed her a can of Comet bathroom cleaner, she asked me how much to use in the bathroom, and I told her to get in that closet-sized bathroom and swirl that can of comment like a fucking tornado. <laughs> Just swing it around, sissy. Swing it around. That night, we sat on her front porch listening to the cicadas. I told her, Chelsea, you have to do the next best thing for yourself and your students. There is power in details. Please make sure that you're taking care of yourself. Through time and perseverance, Chelsea Lewis regained her balance. The comet cleaner brightened up that godforsaken bathroom. And little by little, Chelsea, Chelsea's teaching experience with Teach for America molded her into the devoted, exceptional teacher that she is today. Eight years passed, and in June of 2020, I had the brilliant idea to begin a relationship during COVID. <laughs> he was charming, smart, and kind. He told me he told me he was a corporate pilot, but wasn't flying because of the pandemic. He was doing mortgage broker work on the side until the aviation industry came back. I'm a smart girl. This made sense to me. <laughs> we checked all the relationship boxes, backpacking in Rocky Mountain National Park, bringing him home to meet my spirited Southern family at Christmas, being delighted when his dog had a positive interaction with my cat. We had the perfect equation of compatibility and passion. The whole time, Chelsea had this spider sense, this, um, this uneasiness about him. Carly, you're moving so fast, I, I fear that you're missing something. Who does he actually fly for? Her, his stories don't seem to be adding up to me. In the end, my sister's gut feeling was confirmed. After nine months, the lies of his finances and job came to the surface, and with each lie, his mask was peeled away. <laughs> he was actually a mortgage broker with shitty credit, <laughs> pretending to be a corporate pilot. The profession he had strived to attain his entire adult life. At my dining room table, I looked at him with such pity and confusion. How did I get mixed up in this? Why didn't you come clean? How did I not see your insecurity? We could have solved, we could have solved this together. When I revealed to Chelsea the truth of the man that I had gotten mixed up in, there was only sympathy and assurance from her. On the phone, she said, Carly, do the next best thing for yourself. You will regain your balance, and little by little, your heart will heal, and the light of renewal will come back. She reassured me that what feeds the soul from within is endless, and everything that is living will one day heal. 
Chelsea and I have been separated for almost 10 years. I often think about how our lives compare to each other now. How are they different? How are they the same? I suppose the outside is different. The when, the where, the who. They look different. Where we live, who we lay beside at night, our classrooms, who we unwind with. Chelsea chose to stay in southern Mississippi. She's a devoted wife and high school history teacher. I am a speech pathologist for two elementary schools in southeast San Diego and live with my cat, Dolly, in South Park. <laughs> when I think about... When I think about what is the same, I think about the inside. We share the same motivations, a similar lens we strive to see the world through. Earnest devotion to our family, commitment to public education, and the utter inability to never let anything slide with the other. I never put a foot out of line without the conviction to confess to Chelsea. My whole life, I have been called Chelsea or Lewis Twin. Of course we switched places. I took Chelsea's chemistry test in high school and switched on our junior high boyfriends. <laughs> Once while washing dishes at Chelsea's house, her husband grabbed my ass. I looked the look of horror on his face. The look of horror on his face was well worth it, and I promised, I promised I would never tell. <laughs> but it doesn't matter how many times in my life we have gotten mixed up, because through every peak and valley, she is there. Throughout my life, regardless of the grief of our parents' divorce, the heartache of lost loves, the complete exhaustion of teaching public school. Sissy and I have helped each other sort it out. Any life worth living is messy. And regardless what we get mixed up in, we will both be there to untangle the web and to let the light back in. Thank you. Ma'am, first timer, Carly Lewis. There's a big secret that I'm ashamed to admit, but I'm gonna tell you all anyway. I have ADHD. It sounds, yeah. <laughs> it stands for Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. Simply put, my brain doesn't regulate attention the way it's supposed to. Living with ADHD is kind of like being a celebrity, but instead of paparazzi chasing you, you're chased by your thoughts. They're constantly competing for your attention. You can't always run from them, but you can certainly escape by self-medicating, like I do with weed, alcohol, maybe some other things. <laughs> this makes me one of the 58% of adults with ADHD who also struggle with substance abuse. 58%. Interest and attention are biological functions in the brain. Mind, process, mind processes both of them differently. It's already hard enough for neurotypical people to focus on something that bores them. For my brain, it's almost impossible. How does this affect my life? Well, every week, I'm required to fill out a timesheet for work. Most of you would be able to fill one out in, in about 20 seconds, but this could easily take me up to 20 minutes to finish. That's not an exaggeration. Something like this is incredible, it can be incredibly difficult for people like me. Anytime I don't complete something as simple as this, I appear, lazy, I, I appear to be lazy and careless to the outside world, even though that's far from the truth. Within the last three months, I've already lost count of how many late checks I received due to missing timesheets. The first time I called payroll when this happened, I already knew what they were gonna say before I even picked up the phone. Well, Nick, this, this is what happens when you don't submit him on time. You just need to put a reminder on your phone. 
Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, sure enough, that's exactly what, she, uh, what, what, they, what they said. Timesheets aren't even related to my performance, yet they cost me my hard-earned pay somehow. This is what I face almost every week as an adult. Imagine what it's like for kids. Kids with ADHD receive about 20,000 more corrections by age 10 than their neurotypical peers. Stop moving, pay attention, you're late again, you're too loud, put a reminder on your phone, put your phone away. You have so much potential if only you could just focus. This is what I, hear, this is what I would hear from my teachers every day, every hour, K through 12. Imagine constantly being told to stop doing things you can't control from the time you're a toddler. ADHD is just like climate change and vaccines. Despite overwhelming peer-reviewed literature, people still refuse to believe in it. <laughs> My ninth grade teacher even told me he didn't believe it was real when he found out I had it. Needless to say, I didn't do very well in his class. I mean, how could I if my own teacher thought my learning disability was fake? <laughs> over time, I would internalize myths like this and believed I was simply just overdiagnosed with the condition. It isn't all that bad, though. When something interests me, I can hyperfocus. This is a superpower at work, and I can be extremely productive. Sometimes I become too focused on something, and I tune out danger around me. Years ago at a football game, I really needed to use the bathroom. There was a porta potty on the other side of a 12 foot fence. The reasonable thing to do would be to walk around the fence, right? Wrong. <laughs> that means I would have to look for the entrance, possibly get lost, lose my friends, wait for in line while the game starts. I might pee on myself. No, 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 that's not gonna happen. I'm just gonna climb the fence. It'll be so much quicker and I'll be over with and I'll be on time for the game. Well, I fell, I broke my arm and was rendered another statistic. People with ADHD are three times more likely to be injured or die from freak accidents like this. Anyway, let's talk about school again. <laughs> it was a constant uphill battle. All I ever wanted were straight A's, but the best I could get were C's. And it wasn't for lack of trying or intelligence. Contemporary, contemporary education systems are designed for neurotypical folks. However, I did not know this as a kid and simply just thought I was stupid. Low self-esteem is so prevalent in people with ADHD, it may, soon be used, it may soon be used to diagnose it. Despite my struggles in school, I still managed to get my bachelor's degree and start my career as a tech recruiter. Even though my grades were poor, my teachers always complimented my work ethic. In the corporate world, there was no, there was no longer GPA, study guides, term papers, quizzes. The only metric I needed to focus on was production. As I fixated on this, uh, at each job, I began to excel in my career. In 2019, I landed my dream job at Google. It was a contract position. I had to prove myself to them before I could be hired full-time, but it was a dream I, couldn't, I could have never imagined. During the interview, <laughs> I just assumed they were going to reject me anyway, so I was totally relaxed. <laughs> I already knew the outcome, so what's there to be afraid of? When they gave me the offer, I thought they made a mistake. <laughs> it was a complete shock, and for the first time in my life, I actually felt smart. I was determined to prove myself there. At the end of my contract, they extended it for another year. In 2020, I won an award for exceeding my production goals every quarter. By 2021, I was one of the top performers on the team, but no matter how well you perform as a contractor for Google, you still have to go through their full interview process to keep it fair, and rightfully so. Every single Google employee needs to pass their GCA interview, which stands for General Cognitive Ability. My entire two years at Google, even just the thought of this made me flinch. I completed my interviews, made it all the way to the hiring committee, this is the last stage where a group of individuals vote on your whole application. Not only was my performance as a contractor strong, 
but I also had four internal references, including two of my leads who, dire who directly supervised me. Overall, things were looking really good. The hiring committee usually decides either yes or no when the candidate reaches them. In my case, however, they requested a follow-up interview. They wanted to redo the GCA interview because they had concerns. That means every interview went well except for this one. After pouring my heart and soul into Google for two years, my future depended on this one last interview. Just as my paycheck depended on, uh, depend, depended on my timesheet. I couldn't pass the GCA interview and I didn't get hired. This was one of the most painful setbacks in my life so far, but it forced me to finally accept that I was different and, and, to, learn, and, and to learn more about my cognition. Even though I was diagnosed when I was seven, I had been in just as much denial about it as the world around me. All this time I had been so ashamed of having ADHD, but finally I realized there was nothing wrong with me. There's a whole tribe of people just like me, and I was shocked to realize so many of them had PhDs, ran their own businesses, and held C-suite positions at big companies. My mother had it just like me. She immigrated from Dublin in 1986 with no college degree, no work authorization, only $300 in her pocket, and she went on to create one of the most successful Irish dance schools in the US. Just a few years ago, she took 13 dancers to the world championships, and seven of them placed in the top 10, including first place. Her dancers uh, have also performed in Carnegie Hall, Radio City, the Lincoln Center, Madison Square Garden, uh, Madison Square Garden, et cetera. She paid for my education, leaving me with very little debt. My mom had all the characteristics of someone with this so-called disorder. Adventurous, creative, empathetic, hardworking, entrepreneurial, and also accident prone. My mother and I spoke for the last time on April 10th, not even six months ago. She was visiting my aunt on the Jersey Shore, who was renting a mansion near the beach. The next day, I got a call from my dad at 6 a.m. in the morning. Nick, I'm really sorry to wake you. Something very serious happened, and you need to fly back to New Jersey right away. Mom fell off of a balcony in the middle of the night. She's in a coma. There's no brain activity. It's very dire. We'll never know exactly how my mom's accident unfolded, but we know the balcony railing was too low to be compliant with modern safety regulations. The police and the medical team believe she got up to use the restroom in the middle of the night and simply got lost in an unfamiliar house while it was pitch black and went over the railing. She spent two weeks in a coma before we took her off of life support. The humiliation, shame, and anguish related to my mother's and, and my so-called disorder doesn't actually come from our brains. It's caused by a world that does not yet understand neurodiversity. WebMD still uses words like careless and disorganized to describe my symptoms. My mother was the best role model I could ask for. The most hurtful thing about getting rejected from Google was that I couldn't call her. Sad as I am that Google didn't work out, it forced me to think about cognition differently. I've read more about ADHD than I ever have. This will help me be a better advocate for other folks, uh, other neurodiverse folks, my mother and myself. Over the decades, I be, I've been desensitized to the shame of having ADHD, but now for the first time in my life, I'm finally starting to embrace it. Another VAMP first timer, Nick Stanek.
All right, all right. I get it. I get it. We want to go back to the stories. So here to kick off our second half, give it up for Lucky Pence. I first was made aware of my family's curse when I was seven. The roots of the curse were planted the first morning I saw my mom ripping open silver foil packets of mystery powders. I noticed her making plates and plates of food for the whole family and then eating nothing. I followed her as she snuck back into the corner with her do not open secret adult cabinet. My seven-year-old mind immediately assumed that the meal replacement shakes she hid were a secret elixir giving her magical powers. Why else would she hide them away? When I told her as much, she laughed in a way that made my stomach churn. Her raw, joyless laugh was the first clue that something about this was too big and too painful for me to understand. She said that they weren't magical. They were a test. She had them to prove she could be good. I was 14 and sitting at the kitchen table looking at my mother when I finally understood. She had just started a new diet and was walking me through the portions and restrictions. Mom, how long do I have to do this before I'm skinny? She leveled me with the dull, steady gaze of the long-suffering and officially passed on what I came to know as the curse. Skinny comes and goes. Most likely, you're going to struggle with your weight your whole life. Laid out like that, my inherited destiny seemed so simple. I was going to struggle with my weight for the rest of my life. I was still young enough to imagine it with a mound of romanticized whimsy. It felt like I had been given a mortal enemy with whom to do battle. I'd read enough fairy tales and seen enough Lord of the Rings to know a curse when I heard one. Now, it was my job to manage the curse like my mother did before me. I would struggle and be seen struggling with the size of my body until it weighed an acceptable amount. And when it did, I would struggle to maintain it. That was my destiny. Curse survival lesson one, the noble sword of struggle. As the cursed one in my generation, it was my duty to invest in weight-defying practices. I delved into Weight Watchers, NutriFast, and half a dozen knockoff diets interspersed with periods of shameful luxury. The magical foil packets that helped me prove I was good began to work exactly as prescribed. When I drank the meal replacement shakes, I was confident, competent, and successfully staving off the curse. When I didn't, I gained back weight more quickly each time. I couldn't win every battle with the curse. Some I lost to family parties or tacos. I lost a lot of battles to tacos. <laughs> and when I didn't hate myself, it felt good. Something about refusing to eat felt righteous. Like my mother before me, I was doing sacred battle with the evils of fatness. Self-control was my blade, and being a good fatty was my shield. See, the unspoken rule about being fat is that as long as you are trying to lose weight, you count as a real person, mostly. If people know you're struggling, it's easier for them to forgive your actual weight. And if you're doing indefinite holy battle against your own BMI, you need a shield like being a good fatty to protect you. Curse survival lesson two, the sacred shields collapse. The shield of being a good fatty who is trying to lose weight couldn't protect me from everything. Making sure others knew about the struggle satisfied most qualms that others had with my body, but it didn't protect me from everyone, especially doctors. They didn't care whether or not I was already dieting or exercising, they always prescribed more. And most times I came to them with other issues like an ear infection or a UTI, my genuine medical qualms were met with the simmering gazes of nurses and doctors who did not believe a word I said. It hurt, 
physically and emotionally, to be so disbelieved regardless of my actions. I knew that my failure to properly manage the curse was to blame for this. Medical professionals taught me to expect disgust as a response to my body. So perhaps I should have been more prepared the first time that I encountered true loathing for bodies like mine. That was the night my shield broke. It happened on a short car ride from my family home to Applebee's, of all places. <laughs> my brother was driving. I rode shotgun, and it was a rare moment without either parent around. As he often did, my brother used it to let something off his chest that had been bothering him for a while. This particular vent took a different tone to the usual frustrations. I won't repeat what he said. The short version of that 15 minute dose of vitriol is this. Fat people, as in people who looked like me, as in me, I, didn't deserve the air I breathed or the ever growing space my body took up. I was an aberration, a sickening symptom of a social disease, a pitiful excuse for a person, etc. I remember the way his spit hit the inside of the windshield and the seatbelt cutting into my skin because he was so distracted by his own anger, he almost didn't stop in time. A semi flashed past us and my mind saw a version of us that didn't slam on the brakes and I remember wishing that he hadn't stopped. When we got to the restaurant, he stopped and looked at me Quickly, his face contorted into something half apologetic, but still too full of anger to be anything less than gut-wrenching. He flung his hands on the wheel and started a new speech. This one is about how I was different. I was better than the other fat people because I tried. I was already struggling with my weight. What else could I possibly do? If being a good fat person couldn't protect me from this curse, what could? Curse survival lesson three, a losing war. I didn't eat for months after that. The battle to keep my weight down escalated into long nights at the gym and smaller and more controlled amounts of food. My shield was gone, but I still had that sword, that self-control, and I still had a curse to fight. I lost tens of pounds as I spiraled further and further into disordered eating, but for the first time in a long time, it felt like my efforts were finally working. I was convinced that I had this curse under wraps for good. But that's not how a lifelong curse works. Like my mom had said, skinny comes and goes, and when I lost this period of skinny, it took too much of me with it. What once had seemed a satisfyingly dramatic battle for the sake of goodness transformed into debilitating anxiety. One morning, I called my gym buddies, fully sobbing, because I had a single red velvet muffin. I fainted more than once in class and refused to admit it was food related, even when a professor asked. And the first week of a new teaching job, my boss pulled me aside because she hadn't seen me eat anything, and some of the students were asking if I was secretly sick. I screwed my eyebrows together and said, no, of course I wasn't sick. She didn't believe me. I didn't believe me either. With nothing to protect me, I was swinging self-control around like a mad person, not realizing how many of the hits actually landed on me. But wasn't I doing everything? I needed to fight the curse. I was dieting, I was exercising, I was fighting as hard as I could, but I was falling apart in the process. The need to simply survive began to outweigh the importance of fighting this curse. I couldn't fight the curse anymore. Everything took a back seat as I spent all of my time convincing myself to simply survive. My shield was broken. I was breaking. It was time for me to put down the sword. Survival lesson four, surrender. Refusing to fight the curse didn't make it disappear. In fact, after I decided not to go on any more diets and not to weigh myself, it got louder. I wasn't fighting, but I also wasn't hurting. 
I, was, I wasn't fighting, but I was also still hurting. My mother passed on the curse because she didn't know what else to do. I think about her caustic laugh when I suggested the meal placement shakes were magical. I think about her slanting brows and slumped shoulders when she told me I would struggle with my weight my whole life, just like she does. I think about my brother spitting fear and rage and the wild hope that it would make him feel more acceptable to himself. Neither of these people were the ones who had starved me until my mind broke. Neither of them were the ones that I was destined to do battle with. It may have started with others' words, but now the curse was a whole other creature living inside my mind, and it had only known violence because that is what I had taught it. It screamed at me to either fight back or die, and neither of those options sounded particularly appealing, so I needed help. Survival lesson five, you're not alone. There were a number of people that influenced my ability to recover, but the first one came from an unexpected sphere of influence. I stumbled on the Instagram account of one Megan Jane Crab. Her pictures show a fat woman dancing in a bathing suit on the beach and posing in lingerie. She had captions like, fat does not mean ugly. Fat is not a bad word. And if you are fat, be fat, but fall in love with yourself all the same. Megan was the first person I encountered who talked about being fat without talking about struggling with her weight. Here was someone who had been cursed like me and refused to let it define her. From there, I found about a dozen similar accounts that said I was acceptable, of, I was acceptable and deserving of survival and kindness and sometimes tacos. In 2019, I checked myself into eating disorder recovery, and all of the fundamental principles of eating disorder recovery were based on something that would have been radical and foreign to me if I hadn't run into Megan's account first, self-compassion. This is what self-compassion looked like for me. I ate regular meals, I practiced the exercises, I did not talk to my family about food or weight. Eventually, I stopped trying to lie to the program director, Doug, about my habits. <laughs> I started talking to the curse like it was someone with very sharp teeth that I was determined to befriend. And after about five weeks after the program started, I woke up one morning, stretched, started journaling, felt my stomach rumble, and made myself food. About halfway through laying down sliced strawberries, I saw the cream cheese begin to repel bits of water, and I realized I had been crying onto my bagel. <laughs> I had been hungry, and I made food, and I didn't think about it. My curse was quiet. For the first time I could remember, my body signaled that it needed something and I didn't doubt or repel that instinct. It truly hit me at that moment that there could be a life not defined by a desire to lose weight. It felt the way seeing a sunrise after a long winter night feels. It's cold and it's sharp and it's bright, like there's a world full of life you didn't know existed and it's even more beautiful and alien than you had imagined. Thank you. That is Lucky Pence, everybody. All right. Who doesn't love yearbooks? Who hasn't cracked one open and jumped straight to the page with the yearbook photo in a pseudo-narcissistic kind of way? Even the most jaded and cynical of students get the dopamine rush that comes with seeing yourself and being acknowledged. It's like you're validated as a person because you're now immortalized forever in a $15 scrapbook. It also serves as a time capsule of sorts, taking a period of your life and preserving it in a keepsake. Anyone who's ever felt that 
twinge of nostalgia looking at grade school photos and seeing the faces of people you haven't actually seen in years knows what I'm talking about. Here's the thing. As a chronic introvert, yearbooks had an entirely different meaning for, to me. They served as a way for me to gauge how I was truly perceived by everyone else. Like an alien hiding out amongst humans, I scanned the pages of my yearbook every year to see which photos they decided to use. What narrative was being told about me as a person by the yearbook committee? Or the poor faculty who got stuck with it that year. <laughs> to my way of thinking, a yearbook was not unlike a piece of literature. There were roles to be played and characters to play them. And every character had their trait. As such, for a, burgeoning, for a bunch of burgeoning adolescents in the midst of discovering who they might be, a yearbook served as a character sheet. A specific moment in time captured. A blurb or a caption could mean the world. It meant that you weren't just a side character in the story. Even if it was for just a moment, you could feel like a celebrity, someone notable enough to make it on the page of a yearbook. And all of this would culminate in the final chapter, your last year at school. This was the yearbook in which there were not only full pages dedicated to students moving on, but also where the final judgments were pronounced, the most likely to section. So it's eighth grade. And I've been going to the same school for almost nine years of my life. The biggest concern on every kid's mind was looking cool in front of their friends, and, well, I was no different. Mind you, this was a Catholic school, so that was a task in and of itself. <laughs> I was the kid who tucked in his shirt, sported a Cartoon Network backpack, and had an afro straight from the 70s. <laughs> I was the kid still playing superheroes in the playground at lunch and reading for fun. It probably didn't help that I was also an altar server, the kid who stood up on the altar every Friday mass in a slick white potato sack. <laughs> Suffice it to say, I wasn't exactly the coolest kid in my class. This meant that I never really met the coolness requirements to be involved in any group activities. I wasn't playing a sport, I wasn't going to any parties. I lost the school election twice, so I wasn't on student council. Instead, I went home after school, did my homework, and call it a day. I was there every day of school, mind you, but I was essentially an extra whose line you forgot two seconds after he said it. The worst part of it all was really not knowing where I stood with everyone. I didn't know how they saw me or whether they saw me at all. But that's where the yearbook would save the day, baby, especially my eighth grade yearbook, the final chapter. I would finally understand how I left my mark on this school. This year, our teacher decided to do something a little different. She wanted to make a slideshow that would celebrate our graduating class. This was the late 2000s, so burning slideshows on a CDs probably seemed like a cool idea. So here I was, at the end of the school year, holding a CD with my name on it. I was putting a lot of my hopes into this CD since the physical yearbook this year was kind of a bust. Besides the very lovely page dedicated to me, made by my mother, it was like I didn't exist that year. If someone didn't know any better, my dedication page seemed more like a memorial to a kid who just vanished out of existence. <laughs> when I say vanished, I mean like Joseph Stalin himself ordered that I be erased from history, vanished. <laughs> I was cropped out of photos, obscured by other photos and collages, and if I did show up, I was a blob in the distance. For someone who was moving on from nine years with the same group of kids, it, it hurt somewhat to think that all I might be remembered as was a splotchy background character. The CD was my last hope for immortality. So I ran home, cracked open the plastic case, and threw it on the desktop. And immediately I was greeted by a Windows Movie Maker video. <laughs> Accompanied by Jack Johnson's Upside Down. <laughs> The very first image I saw was the slide titled, Most Likely to Become a Priest. <laughs> and wouldn't you know, my name was up there with a couple other students. The video then cut to an image of the other two classmates deemed most likely to become a priest, uh, but I was nowhere to be seen. I wasn't even in the picture. The video went on to show several other categories, including, but not limited to, most likely to succeed, most popular, and most likely to invent something, all with pictures. 
the video lasted about 20 minutes, Jack Johnson playing on the entire time. <laughs> and then it ended with congratulations to our class. I sat back and adjusted what I just witnessed. Priest, I thought. Priest? Was I so lame that my only claim to fame was guy who really loves Jesus? <laughs> what did I do to end up with this label? Did, did all those years of altar serving come back to bite me in the ass? <laughs> Why did my teacher think any 13-year-old would want to be stuck with most likely to become a priest? <sighs> After the, the initial shock wore off, something else dawned on me. In the entire 20-something minute compilation, my name appeared a total of one time, which would have been bad enough, but I didn't even actually make an appearance. Not ever. I was less than a background character. I was barely even a reference. Nine years at this school with these people, and my legacy amounted to likely priest, picture not shown. At the time, at the time, this was devastating. I'd been so invisible to these people that they genuinely couldn't think of any qualities I had as a human being. I was so invisible, I wasn't even in the picture. In their defense, I was never more than a wallflower to them, so in a way I did this to myself, but it was crushing. Nevertheless, I was I'm sorry, I was more than ready to move on from middle school and leave all that behind me for high school. High school, I decided, would be where I changed everything. And I did. High school was a completely different experience. Uh, I spoke with people who actually wanted to speak with me. I had teachers who genuinely noticed who I was and was in what I was interested in and cared to ask me if they didn't. I even made a group of friends who embraced all the weird things about me, my love of playing Dungeons and Dragons on the weekends, going to see every Marvel movie in theaters opening night. Someone who would rather talk about a British show from the 60s than whatever was on now. I prefer hanging out at museums and bookstores and reading for fun. Most importantly, <laughs> most importantly, I felt like a person, a human being. I felt seen. And mind you, there was still the anxiety that came from being a teenager, but I wasn't worried about being left out or being a nobody. I didn't care about what I was being labeled, and there were no expectations for me to be anything but myself. See, therein lie the hidden benefit of having been invisible in middle school, a benefit I failed to realize at the time. Leaving middle school, I had no expectations put upon me. I wasn't most popular, so I had no desire to try to be. I wasn't most likely to invent something, so I didn't stress myself out when I hadn't. Apparently, I wasn't most likely to succeed, and so, I succeeded in spite of it. The only thing I had to worry about was letting down the people who thought I might become a priest. <laughs> but how could they hold it against me if I wasn't even in the picture? <laughs> At age 14, I began to see that I didn't have to base my image on the opinions of others. I didn't have to play a bit part in some overarching story. I began to understand that if you know your identity and are recognized for it by others, well, that's something to be proud of. And if you don't, well, you're not gonna find the answers lying around in a $15 scrapbook or a CD. In my freshman high school yearbook, with its 100 pages of, 20 pages of student portraits and events, staged pictures of sports teams, theater groups, bands, and after-school clubs, along with candids of sports heroes being heroic, theatrical students being theatrical, and musicians just being cool, I was featured a total of one time in a two by three inch photograph with my name next to it on a page filled with other two by three inch photographs. But it didn't matter because I knew I had friends and teachers that saw me as I was. And that was more than enough for me. That's another band first timer, Robert Lang.
Like many of us, in high school, I was a ball of hormones and rage. <laughs> and also, like many of us, I thought it would be a great idea to put my every thought on the internet for all to see. Coming of age in the aughts was an interesting time. While our parents' generation certainly kept diaries, for the first time, we were doing so publicly. And this was before the etiquette and rules we have today. Before the time of the reply all faux pas, or the risk of being called out as a troll if we took our opinions too far. Our live journals, zangas, blog spots, blurties, and open diaries bore our deepest, emo we got Zanga back there, bore our deepest emotions for all to see. And not only did these diaries not have locks, we were metaphorically ripping the pages out and pinning them to a bulletin board, otherwise known as the friends page. Posts could be public, friends only, or completely private though most of us never opted for the latter. How else would our best friend know we were upset with them? <laughs> we bared our souls for the same reason we did anything as teenagers, because everybody else was doing it and because it felt good. We lived in this amazing gray area between no internet and internet, a wild west of sorts, just on the cusp of social media, and it was delightful. Hedonistically, narcissistically delightful. I recently logged back into my live journal from 2004, my senior year of high school. It was like cracking open a literal time capsule, a treasure trove of esoteric pop culture references intermingled with pure teenage angst and delusion, and if I was lucky, a photo or two. From prom to paychecks, ringtones to pagers, dare to driver's licenses, I wrote about it all, no holds barred. As I work through therapy, now in my adult years, it's amazing to look back at these entries and see, in real time, the genesis of many of the issues I still struggle with today. I can see how these experiences laid the groundwork for my patterns in adulthood, how they grew into my armor against the pain, how my problematic behaviors were really just me protecting myself the best way I knew how. How, at 16, I was just starting to struggle with emotional dysregulation, which would prove to be more than teenage angst, following me well into my 20s and beyond. I was also showing hints of relationship anxiety and disordered eating patterns that would hitch a ride for decades to come. A few of my posts centered on the inherent humiliation, irritability, and social anxiety that comes with simply being alive at the age of 16. On January 25th, 2004, I wrote this entry about a typical annoying dad moment. I went to Price Chopper with my dad, <laughs> but even more embarrassing than simply walking into Price Chopper with my dad, he saw that bagels were buy six, get six free, but only with your advanced hedge card. Yeah, he made me, a 16 year old, stand in line and sign up for a card. So we got our freaking free bagels and left. How dare he? At this age, I was very concerned with appearances and hyper-focused on my family appearing poor. However, as I read this now, I think buy six, get six free bagels sounds like a pretty amazing deal. <laughs> and I've certainly had my share of signing up not only for grocery store discount cards, but email lists, credit cards, and other subscriptions for a sweet deal. Remember being so self-centered that you were convinced the entire world was transfixed on you at all times, even during the most mundane events? On July 11, 2004, I found myself in one such event. It was a moment so enthralling that everyone at the Applebee's in Waterbury, Connecticut is surely still talking about it. <laughs> Went to Applebee's and ate a lot. I love Applebee's. We split the sizzling apple pie, and it was sizzling really loud, and everyone was looking. <laughs> Today, I live for anything that sizzles as loud as advertised, <laughs> and welcome the much-deserved stairs. I also dug up plenty of cultural fossils. I had several posts bemoaning my search for the right screwdriver to change my Nokia phone case, as well as finding the correct keypad to fit that model. I shared links to free ringtone websites. I had lent, and at one point, I had lent my sister some money to buy a belt. 
but only on the condition that she, quote, let me use her CD player and digital camera for the rest of our lives. <laughs> I think I got the short end of the stick on that deal. <laughs> it was also shocking to remember what it was like to work a minimum wage job as a high schooler in 2004. On April 23rd of that year, I lamented. No more frivolous spending. I need money. I make, on average, $100 a week. Where does it all go? <laughs> on May 6, 2004, I was very excited for this news in the land of food and drink. Coke and Pepsi are coming out with Coke 2 and Pepsi Edge this summer. They're made with Splenda, and it's like half the calories of normal soda, but supposedly tastes the same. And McDonald's has salad Happy Meals. It almost makes me happy that America will stop being the grossest country ever. I'm not so embarrassed anymore. Do you want to tell her, or should I? <laughs> this new development excited me, because in preparation for senior prom that year, I was just beginning to obsessively count calories and weigh myself, feeling like I, like I had to earn my food through workouts or starvation. This would send me on a tailspin of endless yo-yo dieting, introducing a disapproving voice eventually silenced only by alcohol. On June 9, 2004, I wrote, the gym isn't enough. Eating good isn't enough. I want to be skinny now. I want to wear skimpy bathing suits tomorrow. It's getting to my head. It feels like being high for me. I always have this totally rational part of me that gets terrified watching the rest drift off, but I just can't control it. Getting my driver's license on June 13, 2004 was a little more lighthearted. I wrote, I'm so fucking happy I passed, and it's scary to think I have my license because I can't drive. <laughs> ha! <laughs> the written was easy. I got them all right. Why was I so nervous? Seriously. My Mima gave me $20 so we could go out and celebrate Applebee's again. <laughs> LOL. The level of drama in my life at that time was remarkable. On June 14, 2004, the day after I got my license and a week before high school graduation, I wrote about this predicament. Here's the predicament. It's my last day of high school, and I'm like the only person ever who never got to drive to school. So I want to. But if I do, that means my friend won't be picking me up this morning, which means my sister doesn't have a ride and she can't ride in my car because of that dumb law. In Connecticut at the time, if you were under 18 and had your license less than a year, you couldn't have another minor in your car, which was probably a fantastic idea, but during this time, it was absolutely destroying my street cred. <laughs> I went on. Why does my sister not care that she's ruining this for me? My one and only day ever to drive myself to school and I feel bad, does she care? Does she care about anything besides her hair and sleeping in late and out-of-town boys in my space? <laughs> I won't let her ruin it. I may feel bad, but it's not my fault. I still have trouble setting boundaries with this sister. Also, I hate driving. <laughs> my long ingrained trauma response of people-pleasing has always favored this sister. I can't say for sure, but looking back at this entry, I can almost guarantee that I didn't drive to school so she wouldn't have to ride the school bus alone. Therapists have asked me to talk to my inner child, to get in touch with the youngest, most hurt parts of myself. And this has felt nearly impossible for me. I've simply forgotten or shut out a lot of my life before my 20s, and my imagination often fails me. But reading these old entries sends me right back into the moment a place where I can sit on the couch right next to my 16, 17, 18-year-old self and tell her it's okay. She's beautiful. Okay, she will be beautiful. <laughs> She's going to do great things. She can eat whatever the fuck she wants, and she will meet a partner who treats her the way she deserves to be treated. I can see my experiences now more clearly than ever, and I have so much compassion for that little girl. Her struggles with her appearance and weight her disorganized home life, high school bullies. When I look at teen Danielle from the lens of adult Danielle, everything that has happened in my life thus far, every trauma I've endured, every shameful moment, suddenly makes perfect sense. Look at what I've been through, look at the tools I never had. 
I also always felt a little lesser than and had a tendency to compare myself to everyone around me, another sleeping giant that awakens every so often, even today. On February 4th, 2004, halfway through my senior year, I wrote, it didn't hit me till just now, but Kelly said something to the extent of, last year people thought she was weird for hanging out with me, and they were like, ew, why do you talk to her? That really hurts me. People still think I'm gross. I thought I worked hard to be liked by most of the kids in our class. It honestly made me just cry. I don't know why. I always say I don't care what they think, but I guess I do. This makes me like embarrassed to go to school tomorrow. Now I'm gonna be wondering who thinks I'm gross and who laughs at me when I'm not looking. It hurts a lot, a lot. That's just one of those things. No matter how good of a day you could be having, if that crosses your mind, you hate yourself and get upset. It almost makes me feel even more alone. Not that anyone really talked to me anyways in school. I was never Miss Popularity, but I had no idea I was gross. In December of 2006, I was 19 years old. It was shortly after I started drinking and 11 years before I would finally quit. I wrote, last night was insane. I didn't wake up feeling refreshed and in a good mood like I usually do after a night of hard partying. <laughs> I woke up feeling empty, vengeful, depressed, angry, fat, alone, sick, everything. To get out of the house, I drove my sister to work, and then someone cut me off, and I just started bawling my eyes out. And like my whole life all at once kind of slapped me in the face. I am empty, vengeful, depressed, angry, fat, sick, and alone. But most of all, I'm angry. There is so much anger inside of me, not even in a new metal way. I'm just pissed off. I'm miserable. My dad makes me so mad. My friends make me so mad. Driving makes me so mad. Work makes me so mad. But it's not them, it's me. Maybe I'm just a mad person. I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to drink and forget everything anymore. I'm wasting my life. I'll probably delete this later. Spoiler alert, I did not delete that later. <laughs> I would have innumerable entries like this. They would lament my own existence and promise to change, to grow up, to move past drama, to quit letting other people in my life down. Reading this as a 35-year-old woman, something struck me. I had been repeating these self-loathing mantras and commitments to radical change for nearly 20 years. I had been emotionally stuck in my late teens. Like a powerful anti-venom, I've started to find my antidote in these old poisons. As painful as it was to revisit some of these moments, and for as many friends who I know have deleted their journals out of sheer shame and embarrassment, I'm so grateful that I'm able to cherish these relics of my childhood. They've proven to be more helpful than 18 years of therapy and decades on and off of antidepressants, and definitely more helpful than the myriad other ways I've tried to heal my wounds in adulthood. Crystals, psychics, acupuncture, astrology, religion, hypnosis, life coaching, sound healing. Not to say that these modalities weren't helpful, but without an actual memory of what I was trying to heal, it was hard to know where exactly to aim these interventions. It was a lot like throwing a dart in the darkness. It's not that the dart was defective, but rather my shadows were obscuring my view. Rushing into a marriage and leaving my hometown in dramatic fashion by joining the Navy. Grappling with authority issues during my six years in the military. Seriously, whose idea was that? <laughs> Going through a traumatic divorce before I was 29. Struggling with feeling fully safe and accepted in relationships and friendships. Turning to alcohol to soothe the volatile, searing emotions I was experiencing. Now that I see the roots of these issues, I can finally attack them with the precision of an angry teen stealing hair dye and bald chain necklaces from Hot Topic. <laughs> so thank you to that angsty teenager and her indefatigable compulsion to write her every thought. Thank you for finally shedding the light on our shadows and for helping us to heal me. Thanks. That was Danielle Baldino. 
another Vamp first timer. Is it just me, or do you guys want to all go to Applebee's? <laughs> that is our show. Give it up, you guys. I want to give a huge thank you to our FAMP volunteers tonight, Adam Greenfield, Brent Hannafy, and Killian Whitelock. Big shout out to all of our FAMP coaches. In case you didn't know, every performer up here tonight worked with both a writing coach and a performance coach or a VAMP mentor to help them tell their story and help them tell it better. So give it up for all of our coaches, mentors, and volunteers. And give it up for our VAMP writers. Huge congratulations to Robert Lang, Lucky Pence, Tiffany Cooper, Danielle Baldino, Bianca Sanchez, Carly Lewis, and Nick Senek. Thank you. We'll see you next month.